Good evening and welcome. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here with my friend and one of my favorite writers on issues in China, Jeff Wasserstrom. And, um, you know, Jeff, you've been going in and out of Hong Kong for 30 years, um, quite frequently over the last five years, two or three times a year. I go back in Hong Kong 25 years. No one needs to convince us why Hong Kong's important, but if someone asks you who hasn't been covering Hong Kong, who hasn't been going there very much or following it, why should I care? What would you say? So I think there are a bunch of reasons to care about Hong Kong. Um, it's a very inspiring struggle going on right now against enormous odds. And this kind of David versus Goliath uh, story, or as young Hong Kongers think of it, Hunger Games story, about uh, young people taking bold actions to try to stand up for what they believe in against seemingly impossible odds, is something that's going to be inspiring and that is inspiring people in many places. And not just authoritarian places, it can also inspire people fighting against climate change and the climate strike movement. There's sort of been exchanges between Greta Thunberg and uh, Joshua Wong, finding each other inspiring and things and like Joshua that. And Joshua Wong was one of the leaders of the umbrella movement in 2014. Exactly. And I bet another thing, another reason uh, that speaks to the present is there's a great value. One of the things that's being fought for in Hong Kong is the ability to have a press that operates more freely than the press operates on the mainland. The, fact, the ability to have a strong press in a place beside um, the Chinese mainland at a time when something's being covered up on the Chinese mainland is something that can be valuable in Hong Kong, but valuable to the world. And I think we saw that with the SARS crisis, um, which is on minds again with the vi coronavirus issue, that having people who are near to the Chinese mainland but not con as constrained as journalists on the Chinese mainland are, is very important when there's anything being covered up, any kind of misdeeds. And you know, there are bold uh, journalists who I really admire who are trying to get stories out from the mainland now about issues that the government uh, wants to control. But it's very important to have a space near there where we can get information out there that's even freer. So Hong Kong's also been important to the world and important to China in other ways over the course of you know, more than a century. You're a historian, thumbnail sketch. Why did Hong Kong become so important to the world as a financial center? So Hong Kong became very, Hong Kong, one of the recurring themes in Hong Kong history is that it and the people there do things that nobody expected them to be able to do. So Hong Kong became a British colony in, 18, in the 1840s as part of the Opium War, the end of the Opium War, the British were frustrated by not having enough access uh, to this great untapped market in China, which has always been the stream of, um, of foreigners to get greater access to it. Uh, the Portuguese had this um, place on the Pearl River Delta, Macau, as a colony. Um, Western traders, American and British traders, were consigned to just being in part of Canton for part of the year. After the Opium War, which was partly a fight for um, this kind of increased access, um, the British got Hong Kong. Um, the British negotiator who got Hong Kong um, for the British was fired because the British felt this was too meager a prize for winning a war and thought that Hong Kong was, was a, you know, a, a barren hill with barely a, a house upon it and would never amount to much. Hong Kong amounted to a great deal. It was soon a port rivaling um, nearby Canton, surpassing Macau, one of the great ports on the China coast along with Shanghai that was partly open to foreign trade and settlement at the end of um, the Opium War. So Hong Kong became an incredibly important entry point and exit point for goods coming into and out, out of, um, of China. Hong Kong and Shanghai together became the key financial centers there. And we still see that um, in the Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation, which had a foot in both of these major port cities that were two very cosmopolitan cities, one at the mouth of the Yangtze River, which is, runs through sort of the center of China, uh, Hong Kong at the mouth of the Pearl River that runs through the, the, the southern part of China. And the two of them, the bank had a foot in both places. Um, there were stock markets in both places. They 
alternated um, centrality. Shanghai became the most important financial um, and economic hub. But then when Shanghai got absorbed by the People's Republic of China and Hong Kong re remained separate, Hong Kong became the main base for the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation. The Hong Kong Stock Exchange became the most important stock exchange in the area. So it became the leading financial center. And it was an important financial center for the West and for international trade. But it was also the one place where money could be moved into and out of the mainland with the mainland remaining separate, but it not being completely separate. And that's part of the whole story of Hong Kong in many ways, of being sort of part of China, but not quite in various different ways. Right. So there was also, as one example, there was this thing called round tripping mm. of money. So in the 80s and 90s, um, something like half of the foreign direct investment coming into Hong, uh, coming into China was coming from Hong Kong. It was coming out of China, going through Hong Kong and coming back. It was round tripping, both because there was there were lower tax rates in Hong Kong and also because when it came in as foreign direct investment, um, there were certain um, incentives to bring it in so that you know you you made more money bringing it in that way. Um, and it was at that time in the 80s and the 90s, in the 80s to be specific, that China made it clear. Uh, you know, you thought you were going to hang on to this in perpetuity. We actually want it back. And, and China had some cause to be able to demand that Hong Kong be given back because Hong Kong came to Britain in pieces. It, it became a colony for Britain in pieces. So, yeah, it's great. The first part of um, it's wonderful to have a session moderated by somebody with such a deep knowledge of Hong Kong and who's somebody who I've listened to over the years reporting on the things that then I work into my classes. And so, you know, this is a real treat, treat for me. But yes, Hong Kong coming in pieces is a great way to describe it. Hong Kong Island became a colony um, in the 1840s. And then after another war, uh, another piece of Hong Kong became part of the British colony, Kowloon, uh, the peninsula right across from the island. And then in 1898, a series of um, villages, islands, all kinds of, of further land connecting to the mainland became part of Hong Kong as the new territories. And, but they didn't become a permanent colony. They became um, subjected to a 99-year lease. So 1898, you're all smart people can do the math. That means 1997 was always going to be an expiration date. And one of the odd things about Hong Kong, besides the fact of it always surprising people in differing ways, is that it's often people have lived there with a sense of an expiration date, a time coming when things are going to dramatically change in uncertain ways. The first of those expiration dates hanging over there was 1997, which would be the handover. The second one is what's happening now is 2047, because when the handover happened, part of the deal was that Hong Kong would be able to retain a high degree of autonomy and largely maintain its way of life for 50 years. So from 1997 until 2047. And this was all spelled out in the basic law, what has been called, not entirely accu accurately, Hong Kong's mini constitution, which was the agreement between China and Britain, but it was drafted by people handpicked by the Chinese government. Right. The Chinese government <clears throat> put a thumb on the scale. And that's yet another thing. It's been separate, but been, um, it's, not an, it's not an equal kind of separation. And this was under the idea of one country, two systems that Hong Kong would become part of the country, the People's Republic of China, but it would have its own system. And what exactly it means to say that it has a different system is part of what has fueled uh, the protests in recent years is a very different understanding of what that uh, two systems part of it means. For Beijing, it's become very clear that right now what Xi Jinping thinks the systems that are different should just be economic systems, that Hong Kong should be able to do things somewhat differently economically, but should not have a politically different or culturally different system. Um, Hong Kong people have a different view of that. Beijing would, in a sense, like that one country, two systems to be the other 
col former colony that I mentioned, Macau, had been a Portuguese colony. It became part of the People's Republic of China in 1999. And it also has a one country, two systems. But while there's a bit more democracy there, a bit more freedom of speech and freedom of the press, in political terms, Macau just doesn't function that much of a thorn in the side of Beijing. What Macau is different is there are different ways to make and spend money there, particularly casinos. So in a kind of Xi Jinping's fantasy, I think, we don't know much about what Xi Jinping thinks, but he reveals things here. He thinks it wouldn't it be great if Hong Kong was like Macau, a place that in political terms was very much brought within the fold, but had somewhat different uh, economic functions, which as, as Mary Kay mentioned, could be very useful to uh, the Chinese government. Yeah. It also seems, though, that from the time the, um, the basic law and the one country, two systems agreement was put into place in 1984, um, it, for a while, Hong Kong and China kind of moved uh, in roughly the same direction. I mean, Hong Kong was, all, was, was actually becoming more democratic under Governor Chris Patton. Mm -hmm. um, China seemed to be loosening up a little in the mid late 80s as well. Um, and then, you know, there, there was the Tiananmen crackdown. Hong Kong people were really quite shocked by that. There have been massive candlelight vigils every year since then. We both attended the one this year. Yeah. Uh, and um, it, it gave a lot of Hong Kong people pause where they were thinking, ah, uh, yeah, you know, what are we actually going toward here in, into the 90s? And, you know, when I lived in Hong Kong in 95, 96, um, as a journalist talking to people with a microphone, there weren't a lot of people who wanted to talk on mic about political issues related to China. There was a lot of uh, fear, caution. Some people were looking forward to the handover, but a lot of people were hedging their bets, getting second passports. Some were leaving. Some were just hoping, you know, look, let's hope that we can continue our way of life the way we have it. Um, and then, you know, China's growth accelerated. Um, there were also was another period of openness in China, you know, from around the time of SARS for about mm -hmm. five, six years, um, when again, Hong Kong people had reason to think, you know, maybe what's in the basic law, which includes a somewhat vague promise of universal suffrage that every Hong Kong person could vote, would actually happen. Um, that has not come to be the case. But before we get to that and talking about kind of the evolution of the protest culture in Hong Kong, maybe you could explain, I mean, like, how do people vote in Hong Kong? Um, I mean, what do they have if not universal suffrage? So it's a very <laughs> convoluted, complicated uh, structure. It is important to realize that people in Hong Kong didn't get to vote for who ran, uh, who ran Hong Kong before 1997. It was a British colony. So somebody was appointed by, by London um, and was the, the governor there. And, but there, were, there was some degree of um, election for people who had a kind of advisory capacity. And in some ways, there was a carryover. There was an expansion of that once the British knew they were going to be giving up Hong Kong. And the idea with the basic law was that what was happening in Hong Kong, at least the, um, the last um, British governor, wanted this idea to be that the 50 years of staying the same would be whatever uh, Hong Kong was at the last moment of British rule. So introduced some kind of reforms that were admired by some more democracy, but others thought was too little too late, um, and that the Chinese government felt was not really playing fair because they were supposed to um, inherit something that uh, was more kind of stable and with less of the popular vote. Um, but there, there, are various things, there are various kinds of votes in Hong Kong at different levels. For um, the legislative council, um, for district councilors, there was just a, a big election in which pro-democracy forces swept into power at the lowest level, at the district council level, that meant a lot. And it was amazing that there was that kind of election uh, you know, we've got a balance. I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about how uh, the Communist Party is exerting greater and greater control over Hong Kong. But it's extraordinary that a city was part of a Communist Party-run 
country and yet had these very different elections for as long as they did. But the key sticking point has been that the chief executive, the person who has the most uh, power of all in Hong Kong, is elected, elected, but by a very small group of people. Around 2,000 people actually do the electing. And the only people who can stand for that post are people who basically have been vetted and Beijing feels will be enough um, in line with sensitive to central policies. So that's part of the problem. And the Legislative Council also has a very complicated structure where some mem people are elected uh, directly, but some are elected by different constituencies, groups, occupational groups like accountants have somebody that they get to have on the council. It's set up so that there can never be a clear majority of, of people on the council it's, it's stacked against there ever being a clear majority that are uh, pro-democracy. Do you think the Chinese government ever intended to allow Hong Kong to have universal suffrage in the way that Hong Kong people who go out in the streets and protest for more democracy expected it? I mean, I think this was, I think from the beginning, there was a level of ambiguity to the wording, and including the one country, two systems, um, in which the, in which, um, the idea was that each side could sort of dream a different dream and p project it onto that document. And there was a discussion that there, the, the people of Hong Kong would get to choose who governed them. But the idea of uh, kind of robust comp competitive elections and things like that, um, it's hard to imagine the Chinese Communist Party ever being able to really um, put up with that. But the Chinese Communist Party w itself, it's also important to remember, we, we didn't know that it, what trajectory it was going to go on to. The Chinese Communist Party has been a tremendously experimental organization yeah. from the get-go. I mean, it's done things under, under Mao. It did, did things that veered very much from the standard um, mode of Marxist um, communist parties. Communist parties supposed to come to power focusing on cities. Mao had a different spin on Marxist theory, where it would be the peasantry, which, Mao, which Marx thought of as a backward class, would lead the revolution. There were all kinds of experiments, some of them, some of them horrific, in their impact, things like the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. But some of them seem to be experiments after Mao that were experimenting with village elections um, under Deng Xiaoping. And by 1984, when the agreement was, was worked out to hand Hong Kong back, a lot of people in the West, including uh, Margaret Thatcher, but she wasn't alone in this, was thought China is starting to embrace more forms of um, free markets and capitalist economy. It will gradually, the middle class will grow, and it will gradually, as it becomes more in step with free markets, it will start being more politically liberalized. There was a period from 84 until 89, until the, the massacre, June 4th, 89, really, when it seemed possible that China was on this trajectory of getting um, more and more liberalized, and who knew what kind of country uh, mm -hmm. the one country of those two, with two systems would be. After 89, there was a sense of giving real pause to that. It, it really showed the hard edge of the Chinese Communist Party when faced by massive challenges. Um, Margaret Thatcher, I talk about this in, in, in Vigil. Margaret Thatcher was on a call-in show um, one year after the massacre, and somebody asked her on BBC, you know, what do you think about the situation for the Chinese people? And she said, well, of course, I'm very concerned about what kind of China Hong Kong will be joining. And of course, I have to think about the Hong Kong people. Um, there was the massacre a year ago, which was a, had a kind of chilling effect. But, she said, she was confident that things were going to go back, in, uh, back onto the right track, because Deng Xiaoping seemed to be clear that he wanted economic reforms to continue. And she doubled down on this view, which again, many people on both sides of the political spectrum felt in the West. Um, that when the economy liberalized over time, gradually at least, the political system would liberalize. And she was wrong about that. And lots of people were wrong about that. Bill Clinton was wrong about that, just to show that I'm not just picking on, on conservatives. Um, but she said one other thing in that. She said, the Chinese Communist Party will honor its promises to Hong Kong because it will want to be seen in the forum of the world to have honored its promises to Hong Kong. It was say, she was saying this at a time where, and you could imagine it in the late 20th century and even early 21st century, 
when Beijing, whatever the leaders in Beijing wanted to do, they were very sensitive that they wanted to be accepted into the international order more. They wanted to be able to host the Olympics. They wanted to be able to be in WTO. So they would have to be, uh, they would have to live up to a variety of, of promises and at least not, not engage in certain kinds of repression in a place like Hong Kong after it became part of the mainland. The Chinese Communist Party now is in a very different position. The forum of the world is a very, a very different position. The international order is much less stable and China, the Chinese Communist Party feels much more able to flaunt the, the opinion of the foreign of the world when it wants to. But at the same time, China is trying to build out the Belt and Road, the New Silk Road all over the world in more than 100 countries, building infrastructure, roads, railways, ports, dams, and more, and really to try to shift the center of gravity of global trade and, and global power to China. And for that to happen, people in other countries need to trust China. And when they look at Hong Kong and when they look at what's happening with the coronavirus, what happened long ago with SARS in 2003, it's like, okay, so you cover things up in ways that hurt people outside of your borders. And when we look at the extent to which you're holding true to what everyone in Hong Kong thought was agreed to, or what many people in Hong Kong thought, thought was agreed to, how do we know we can trust you if we do a de deal with you? So yeah, Belt and Road, this is an enormous issue. And I'm looking forward to a podcast that's going to deal with this that I've heard uh, is in the works. Um, yeah, I think this is a check. And I think, but I think, I think the, um, the world right now, I don't need to, to uh, I, I think an audience like this will, will have appreciate it. The world is very distracted by crises in many places, which provides um, a certain amount of wiggle room for an authoritarian regime to do things that are, that in an earlier, quieter age would have more uh, kind of focus of outrage. So the Chinese Communist Party does care about, um, about international opinion to a certain extent. And I think the, the, the way in which, even the way in which the coronavirus has been handled illustrates this, this idea of trying to contain the issue within the borders of China and often using very draconian methods against its own population is a way of trying to mitigate the degree of, of outrage internationally that could interfere with its, with its ambitions broader. I think in dealing with the Hong Kong protests, um, a message seems to have been sent, however it was spelled out, to the Hong Kong police force, which has behaved very brutally at times against protests. Um, a couple of messages, one is, we want you to handle this. We don't want People's Liberation Army troops to be needed to go in there because that would be seen as having a bigger cost to, um, to, um, to the Chinese Communist Party. And also they don't want the kind of images circulating, circling the world that did after um, the Tiananmen protests. So it's been very striking that there's been a high degree of brutality used by the Hong Kong police force but there has not, there's been very few firing of live ammunition rounds. There's been firing of beanbag shot, rubber bullets, and an enormous amount of tear gas. Yeah, but I was there, there were, the first day they used rubber bullets, June oh 12th. Oh my gosh, yeah. yeah. I had just left to come back um, to, the, to the US mm. um, before that. Um, but these aren't killing people. You know, there are martyrs. The, the, the movement has claimed um, several martyrs, and there are cases, but they aren't the kind of, um, obvious case like um, young bodies gunned down on the it's streets. It's suicides mostly. There are suicides and there was um, a, a young man who, who fell to his death off a parking garage that was being tear gassed. Mm. And these people are um, treated with, the last thing that I saw in Hong Kong, I was back there in December, the last thing I saw was um, a moment of silence. Um, uh, several hundred high school students had organized a very um, moving a vigil, a protest um, to sort of express their enduring commitment to the movement. And it began with a moment of silence with bowed heads for those who had suffered, those who had died, but also had suffered. There's been an uh, Indonesian journalist who was blinded hmm. um, in one eye by, um, by, by the police sh uh, shooting her with either a beanbag shot. I think it was a beanbag um, shot. Um, so there are, is a sense of that. Uh, within the movement of commemorating those who suffer, hmm. but 
there hasn't been the um, the live fire that would create the kind of thing that would be that would cause enormous problems. I think the presumption is by Beijing that would get in the way of these international initiatives. Yeah. So it's been almost exactly eight months since all of this started. Um, something like 80% of Hong Kongers in a survey that was done in December asking 800 Hong Kongers said they were either not very optimistic or not optimistic at all about Hong Kong's future. Um, and yet the, the protests continue. In your book, you use the analogy of a, a frog in water that you know maybe for a time the water gets hotter and the frog doesn't realize uh, how much danger it's in. And that maybe the reason that the protests are continuing now is that a critical mass of Hong Kongers feel that if they don't act now, they won't have another chance. Yeah, first, that's a beautiful <laughs> metaphor. I mean, it's a metaphor that's been used in different settings. I borrowed it from uh, Kenny Leung, a Hong Kong writer, who um, her discussion of this was translated on China Heritage, uh, um, a website out of New Zealand that's been wonderful at covering um, voices from the Hong Kong, Hong Kong movement. I, I think that that's a powerful notion. There is a sense right now among protesters of a last stand, of a now or never moment. And I think it's important, here's where it's important to sort of pull back to earlier protests, including ones in 2003, the year of, of SARS. There was an effort to bring in a new security law to Hong Kong, Article 23. It was something um, written into the basic law that at some point sedition laws should be formed in, in Hong Kong, should be in, implemented, that would control uh, sedition. This was after the Patriot Act had been instituted in the United States, after 9-11. Some elements of Article 23 were not that different from the Patriot Act. They were just sort of giving increased powers to, um, for a government to control actions that it didn't want um, people to engage in. The Hong Kong people saw this, this was a moment when, up until then, people had talked about increases in, in control over the media, mm. increases uh, here and there by um, Beijing, but it seemed that Beijing was putting a light hand on Hong Kong overall. Mm. The temperature was going up very, very slowly for that frog. This was a time when the authorities said, well, things are going so well, let's just ratchet it up a little faster. And they made a strategic mistake. And half a million or so Hong Kong residents, you were there, right? I was in the uh, middle of I it. I wasn't yeah. there at the time. But, Covering it. Um, but so I was following it. It was a very like hot, you. steamy day. <laughs> and of course, this, mm. was a, this was a, metaphorically also, a, mm. a hot, steamy moment. But very peaceful, extraordinarily peaceful. And that's crucial. It was a peaceful protest against a government action, against the local authorities doing something that Beijing clearly wanted them to do, and the authorities backed down. The sedition bill was tabled, was taken, taken off, um, off the agenda for a time. That seemed to suggest that, well, maybe this one country, two systems thing is sort of working. That if something happens that outrages the people of Hong Kong, the people of Hong Kong can, by making use of the right to, um, civil association, to protest, they can actually get the government to listen. And that was a time when it also seemed that um, within China, there was some liberalization going on. Reporters were a bit freer to report on things. Uh, international reporters were a bit freer. Chinese reporters were a bit freer. There seemed to be- and Social media took off and there was like this virtual civil society that started to gain momentum and I think kind of freaked out the party a little bit. Yeah, but it seemed to be moving where year by year, and I was going to the mainland then, and when I would go to the mainland, year by year it seemed if you went into a bookstore, it was incredible that books that would have been banned a couple of years ago were being published. Huh. Um, people were reading and talking about things that it seemed like a resumption of this at least gradual liberalizing trend that had been going on before Tiananmen, and then again a bit in the 90s, and then was going on then. But since 2008, 2009, the trend has been in the other direction. The trend has been to year by year tightening. But even in 2012, when a new, uh, the, the Hong Kong government made another move that seemed like sort of turning the temperature up too quickly, they were talking about bringing in mainland style patriotic education into um, Hong Kong and changing its civics requirements. The assumption was that 
Tiananmen and the massacre of 1989 that can be taught in Hong Kong schools, but can't be taught in mainland schools, they wanted to move so that things like that wouldn't be taught in Hong Kong schools. And there were protests, um, spearheaded particularly by, um, by teenagers, including a very young at that time, Joshua Wong, who later became a leader in the umbrella movement. And these, these protests, um, again, largely peaceful, a bit more militant, succeeded in getting the government to blink, and they, they pulled back on that. So there was a time that these, these nonviolent protests seemed to be working. But one of the things that's important is in 2014 with the umbrella movement, largely nonviolent protests, this time to try to bring about an increase in suffrage towards, toward universal suffrage, changed the way the chief executive was chosen, and they, f they failed to achieve that goal. They were inspiring while they were going on. I went over during, this, um, during the umbrella movement and there, was, there were young people and people of all ages putting up tents and occupying part of central Hong Kong and an, another uh, Occupy Zone in Mong Kok and one um, uh, on Causeway Bay. And these were utopian spaces um, in which people were trying to live out um, the kind of alternative vision of a free polity that they wanted Hong Kong to become, but it did not succeed, and through largely uh, nonviolent means. By 2019, there were nonviolent protests bigger than any that had been seen before, ever in Hong Kong. Some of the biggest protests by percentage of a population seen anywhere in the world, and the Hong Kong government refused to blink, refused to really listen to what the people uh, were saying. And it seemed that the government would only listen if there, were, if there was something that really grabbed attention, like um, the most militant people engaging in uh, some form, at least, of vandalism, of some kinds of, uh, of occupying um, or of, of street action. And a dynamic began that has continued now in which um, there's a police overreaction and then there's some increased militancy and then an even bigger police uh, reaction. And the government only responds at all when things get really, um, the, get, become a real clash. One of the slogans that people have said is, you're the ones speaking to the government. You're the ones that ta have been teaching us that nonviolent actions don't get results. And so there's been this ratcheting up on both sides, but especially on the side of the authorities. The authorities are sometimes working with um, mobsters also to carry out uh, attacks Which on Which is also protesters. a tactic that happens in China, using local thugs to beat up on journalists or people who work with them or sources they talk to. Well, and one of the great ironies, it's a tactic that goes back in China to the pre-communist era. Chiang Kai-shek of the Nationalist Party, fiercely anti-communist, but the Chinese Communist Party now is using a lot of techniques from his playbook. Huh. So there are a lot of, there are ironies. There, the, the Hong Kong government is talking about the protesters very much like the colonial authorities. You should talk about protesters who challenged, it, challenged um, the colonial system. So there's an irony there. The Chinese Communist Party uh, in Beijing is responding to protesters very much like they were responded to when they were the protesters trying to bring down the Nationalist Party. Hmm and when they were trying to uh, lash back against colonialism. The ironies of history. Um, and meanwhile, China's leaders and the state-run media in China, you know, they're sort of hanging back in terms of being seen to be directly involved in violence. Um, but they're using shots, uh, images of the violence on state-run media to persuade Chinese in mainland China, look at these thugs, look at these protesting thugs, look at these hooligans, look at how unpatriotic they are, look at how ungrateful they are. After we've done all of this uh, infrastructure building in the Bay Area, meaning Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Zhuhai, Macau, Hong Kong, you know, this will help their economy, this will be great for them, and look what they're doing. I'm glad you brought up the Bay Area. We're speaking in, the, in this Bay Area. <laughs> yes. The dream of um, the Chinese Communist Party is that the area Shenzhen, Macau, and Hong Kong will become this greater Bay Area that will dwarf the California Bay Area. But like the California Bay Area will be when you move from one part to another, you're just moving from a place where that's really good at doing one thing 
it's a place where people are good at doing something else, and you won't necessarily notice. You'll be able to move across its borders, and going to Shenzhen will be like going from San Francisco to Silicon Valley. And um, so that's the, that's the fantasy, but it's a nightmare, I think, for many in Hong Kong, this idea that it really won't seem that different um, when you get there. Um, but this idea of, of ungratefulness, I mean, there is, and, and the different kinds of media spins on what's been happening. Um, during the Umbrella Movement, initially it was a completely peaceful movement. And um, what really galvanized the population in 2014 went from a small movement to a large one was police using tear gas, which uh, police in Hong Kong very rarely use. That got a lot of people onto the streets. Um, there was a lot of worry uh, in Beijing that there would be sympathy protests across the border. And um, the Chinese Communist Party is haunted by this idea of there ever being protests in lots of places at once. Because in 89, the Tiananmen movement wasn't just Beijing, it was 100 cities across China. And so since 1989, the Communist Party has been willing to allow local actions to take place without too much repression. But anything that connects people across uh, borders, social borders or geographical borders they clamp down on. There was a lot of worry about protests uh, spreading to the mainland. Uh, so there was a, quite a block on any kind of mainland media about the umbrella movement until there were some clashes that allowed some footage to be shown very carefully, not so much edited to, to edited, disproportionately shown to represent a movement that was largely peaceful just showing some acts of violence by protesters. And then those were played over and over again on the mainland. So it was, we often think of censorship and control of the media being about blocking images, but it can also be about flooding the, the airwaves with these images. That's been even more true in 2019, where the mainland media is showing some things. There have been some very nasty, a small number of nasty acts of violence against people by protesters, yeah. including setting one person on fire. Those are shown over and over again as if they represent a movement that still, on the whole, is largely either nonviolent or violence against property, not against people. At the same time, there's been a lot of violence against people committed by the police and by, by, the, by the thugs. That's never shown on the mainland. No images of it, no mention of it. Um, and then the idea is you get sort of two parallel versions of what's going on. And we're used to that. That's not unique to China. It's happening more and more other places, but to a greater extent um, in China because of the greater control of the media. Do you think that's been a shrewd strategy um, by the Chinese government? I think, I think there's an element to it. I think there's been a mix of shrewd strategy and just kind of stumbling. I mean, I think there are moments that um, that this movement could have been diffused or at least ratcheted down if, if, if smarter moves have been made. So it's hard to know. And it's hard to know whether it's bad information making it to the center. That's something we also don't know with, with the coronavirus. Or if it's a matter with the Hong Kong protests of feeling that things are strong enough that maybe this is, if this is a last stand, let's, let's, let's let it play out so that we can be clear what the future li what, what lies in the future for Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, which uh, comes to a question that a couple of people in the audience asked, which is basically, what's the end game here? Um, one of the questions is, both sides do not seem to be backing down. What do you think is the most realistic resolution? Uh, and, and what is the end game for protesters in Hong Kong? Um, are there specific demands that can be addressed to quell the unrest? And of course, one demand has already been met, the spark that lit the fuse was that there was uh, legislation introduced by Hong Kong's chief executive, Kiri Lam, um, to allow extradition from Hong Kong to China. It was technically supposed to be from Hong Kong to Taiwan, but since China claims Taiwan as its own, it would have been to China. And the way it was worded, um, many Hong Kong people said, would suggest that anyone in Hong Kong could be extradited for doing anything that was against the law in China, though not in Hong Kong. And they point to the fact that in 2015, several Hong Kong booksellers were kidnapped and taken to mainland China and charged with crimes that were not crimes in Hong Kong. Um, so um, what, do you, <laughs> what is the end game? When you look at this, I mean, like none of us are fortune tellers, yeah. but as you look at this, what do you think 
So could so happen. None of us are fortune tellers, mm. and Hong Kong has had a particular mm. capability of making those who make forecasts look foolish. People predicted mm. all sorts. I've mentioned one in the 1840s that was wrong, but before 1997, there were predictions that as soon as the Communist Party took control, there would be no newspaper that would criticize the Chinese Communist Party, mm. and there are spin newspapers that continue that publish. What you'll never see in a mainland newspaper is a editorial cartoon mocking uh, Chinese leaders. Xi Jinping. You can see that the booksellers could, before they were kidnapped, publish books in Hong Kong that couldn't be published in the mainland. So a lot of people thought going into um, as after the handover, all that would disappear. They were wrong. There were people who predicted, as things were going pretty well, that Beijing would never try to tighten the screws on Hong Kong. They were wrong too. In the last few years, those screws have been tightening. So we need to know how often Hong Kong has has defied expectations. Even as as early as when I started working on this book, the beginning of 2019, I was not predicting there would be a giant renewal of the umbrella movement and actually something much bigger than the umbrella movement. And I wasn't alone. There were Hong Kong activists who didn't expect, who thought that the sort of Biggest marches were in Hong Kong's past. They might hope have hoped different, differently, but again, so there was much that surprises all along there. Um, the extradition, the, the extradition bill was the specific trigger of the recent um, series of protests, and finally, after a long period of time, it was withdrawn. The protesters say five demands, not one less. One of those demands was that. Um, but the other demands were, and I think the most important demand in many ways, um, is an independent investigation of police act actions. And in in the words, protests. Yes. The violence so that, that's happening that in the protests. Against the protesters. And that became a demand during the movement. Movements often become a struggle for the right to protest itself. There's also a demand for universal suffrage. There are a variety of demands. And the protesters insist we need all five of these demands met or it, nothing counts. That's that kind of last stand thing. During the summer, I'm convinced, though there's no way to test this, if there had been an independent investigation of the police, and if Carrie Lam had said, I'm very concerned about how the police have been acting, they do seem to be somewhat out of control, there would have been many people who would have stopped supporting the protesters or would have urged the protesters to compromise. Instead, that's been, I think, one of the things that kept a high level of support for the protesters. Um, the government has assumed that once protesters started taking more militant action, ordinary Hong Kongers would stop sympathizing with the protesters. And some of the ordinary Hong Kongers have, but many more of them have stayed sympathetic mm. because, I think, of this sense of the police who used to be admired for their degree of restraint seeming out of control. Yeah. So, and at this point, like yeah. a couple million Hong Kongers have been out in the street. Yeah. Yeah, you've got a large percentage of the population that feel and feel that they've, they've got clear evidence that they can't trust the government. So I think the lack of trust is a, is a giant thing. Where it goes from here, it's very hard for me to imagine um, a scenario in which things get better in Hong Kong in terms of the... Um, in terms of there being moves toward um, a real kind of democ democratic selection of the chief executive. The Beijing authorities have stuck with a very unpopular chief executive who seems tone deaf uh, to popular concerns, who seems relatively uninterested at times in um, really representing the constituency she's supposed to represent and more concerned with representing Beijing. So it's very hard to imagine these accomplishing things. On the other hand, the historian in me has to say, many movements persisted even when it seemed utterly impossible that they would achieve their goals. They can take a very long time to achieve their goals and only achieve their goals when something changes in another part of the world. The most powerful example of this that I keep coming back to in thinking about the protests is the situation in Eastern, Eastern Europe in the 1980s across the Soviet bloc, late 1970s. You had a giant movement, Solidarity, in the late 1970s, early 1980s, widespread support, 
gained a lot of, uh, of influence, and then was crushed by martial law. Early 1980s, the leaders of that movement are in prison or are told they can only get out of prison if they leave behind the um, Poland forever. Adam Micknick writes these beautiful letters from prison about why he's not accepting that deal. Because he, he loves the community so much that he doesn't want to have a freer life outside of it. He wants to stay to fight for this. Anybody with smart money who was betting on where Adam Micknick would be 10 years later would not bet that Solidarity would have come to power in 1989. It won an electoral victory on June 4th, 1989, the same date that a massacre was taking place in Beijing. Solidarity that Adam Micknick would not only be out of prison, but um, a power, an influential journalist um, connected to the people who were in power. This was, an, by the mid-1980s, it seemed that was an utter failure. Anti-colonial movements in different parts of the world have seemed to have be fighting against impossible odds. So I think, I don't see how the Hong Kong protesters can win in the short run. But I think some of them are thinking about this as, first of all, that they won't, feel good about themselves if they stop too soon. There's a sense that the umbrella movement stopped too soon. And that even there's a kind of sense that there's a nobility to fighting to fight even for a lost cause if we think of it as the way we think about, say, anti-colonial movements. And at the moment, Beijing is operating toward Hong Kong very much like a colonial possession. There's a sort of a tragedy here because the very space that was created by um, the One Country, Two Systems Agreement um, from 1997 until now um, allowed a generation to grow up where they weren't growing up under colonial rule. Um, and there was enough space that they didn't feel like they were under the thumb of Beijing. Um, there has long been in Hong Kong uh, a certain amount of Hong Kong chauvinism toward mainland China, kind of we're better than you. Um, and, and for a time that was true, even though many people, most people in Hong Kong came from China. And you know, back when I was living in Hong Kong, there was a, a movie that came out called Almost a Love Story, which was about this guy and this, this young woman who, um, you know, he came from mainland China. She was sneering at him, looking down at him. Turned out she had come from mainland China just a couple of years before. And that's kind of the story of Hong Kong, that people come there, they make their fortunes, or at least they try to, um, and they absorb a Hong Kong identity. But when I was in, in Hong Kong in the 90s, I, people would say, I'm Chinese, but I live in Hong Kong. And under, in this new generation, the Joshua Wong generation, those who are in their teens and 20s now, they're insisting, no, we're Hong Kongers. And it, you know, that creates, uh, it's offensive to the Chinese government and to Chinese people. Um, and, and yet they feel like this is something we need to protect and defend. And yet, again, you look at international law, nobody's saying that Hong Kong's an independent country. Mm -hmm. It's hard to imagine how Hong Kong would be an independent country given that their water comes from mainland China. I mean, it would have to be worked out with mainland China. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk a bit about the role that identity has played in the evolution of the protest culture in Hong Kong over these past couple of decades? So identity is crucial. It's become, it's become much more pronounced um, as an issue. I want to say a couple of things. And um, one is that it's important to realize there is, um, a, high de there is a degree of anti-mainlander prejudice among some people in Hong Kong. There is a, maybe even many, and there's anti-Hong Kong sentiment among some or perhaps many people on the mainland. Again, you're so ungrateful. Why don't you right. just say Why don't thank you? you? Right. But both of these populations are actually very diverse mm -hmm. and, and, and complex. And um, there are people who have diverging views in both. There, there are Hong Kongers I know who are very concerned about the anti-mainlander prejudice mm -hmm. within the movement and say that's not the way... To think about, we should find solidarity with people on the mainland who have frustrations with their government as well. There are people on the mainland who feel some uh, sympathy for the Hong Kong protesters, mm -hmm. but maybe can't, um, can't express it. Their generation can, can divide this. Also, when I do events like this on campuses, there'll often be somebody who asks a question at the end, if we've talked about Hong Kong or mainlander tensions, who says, um, 
look, I'm from, I'm from Canton, or I'm from Shenzhen, they'll say it. And I feel left out of this conversation because I have friends and family actually on both sides of the border. I speak Cantonese, and I'm actually quite proud of my southern China identity. Um, and where do I fit in? How does this work? And I think one of the things about the hardening of the, the, the increase of the, uh, the Hong Kong identity has been linked to the increased assertiveness of the Chinese Communist Party in laying claim to Chinese identity and trying to be the sole arbiter of what it means to be Chinese. And we see this through looking at the international exportation of, of ideas, the Confucius Institutes that are set up. They're saying, even though Confucius had nothing to do with the Communist Party, he was Chinese, so we can have a part of him in spreading this. Um, the Beijing Olympics were a moment of the opening ceremonies of the Olympics were a way of kind of the Chinese, Chinese Communist Party laying claim to everything about the Chinese past that could be admirable, from Confucius to Zheng He, who, who went sailing. It's like any, uh, went on great voyages of exploration. The so Belt and Road is another way of not just economically, but symbolically saying, we define Chineseness. And therefore, if your intention with the Chinese government, you don't have the space, it's harder to have the space to say, I'm Chinese and I'm proud of being Chinese, but I'm not that, I, I don't buy into that, that vision of Chineseness. And, and there's been space for that at other times. And generations themselves can be complex. I know um, a leading uh, young activist who thinks back when sort of he was musing with me of wonderment about how in 2008, he was really excited that China got the Olympics. That at that point, now he's very intensely identifying as Hong Kong, not Chinese. Mm. But at that moment, it was still working. He was proud that China was getting to host the Olympics. But that was maybe the last moment before this hardening of things. And the Olympics were a great moment for one country, two systems, because the Beijing Games, the Games were held in Beijing, but the equestrian sports were held in Hong Kong. You could say that, in a sense, Hong Kong got to share in the party. It got benefits from the one country part, from being part of the same country. Whereas right now, at moments like with the coronavirus and with local authorities taking their cues from Beijing about how to deal with this and the disease spreading, for Hong Kong people, it's hard to figure out, like, so what's the advantage of being part of that one country? If when flights are banned, some countries are saying, we don't, even before there were cases actually linked to Hong Kong, we're saying we're blocking all flights from China. Oh, and that'll include Hong Kong. So there's been an increase in the sense of identity, which we saw before this, actually, with the increase of, of a Taiwan identity in Taiwan for related kinds of reasons. So you've got this blending of the region through all of the infrastructure projects where the Chinese government is like, you know, in a matter of a few years, you know, it'll be hard to tell where you are in the region. You just move across borders. Hong Kong people are saying, no, no, we're, we're different. Our way of life is different. We want it to continue to be different. We're Hong Kongers. Um, and, and therein lies the irresolvable tension um, that, um, you know, the Chinese government according to the agreement, should be giving Hong Kong breathing room for another 27 years. But um, Xi Jinping has said, uh, if you look at the basic law, you look at the fine print, it says that the National People's Congress can interpret the basic law. It has the right to interpret it. So the basic law is whatever we say it is, basically. Um, it almost feels then that the protests are, as you were saying earlier, it's kind of a final cri de cour of we're kind of stuck, you know, mm -hmm. this, the, we'd like to try to keep as much space as we can for what we've come to appreciate um, in terms of civil rights, in terms of space to speak our minds. Um, but we're seeing that space closing. Yeah, it's a, it's a grand, largely tragic kind of moment. And it's hard. I, I felt before these waves of protests I, I began working on the book with a sense of clearly uh, time running out, and, and there are Hong Kong, Hong Kong activists, people who talk about that, use the, the metaphor of a doomsday clock hmm. that's ticking down, and you, the best you can do is try to throw yourself against it to have it stop ticking forward. 
and there, you know, and there are these small successes, and you treasure them. Things like the district elections, or it's not so small. It's a really significant uh, thing to have pulled off, but it's hard to feel that it will change the trajectory um, in the long run. But the thing is that things can change. The world can change. And things that we don't see coming can happen. Um, we, didn't, we didn't really see figures like uh, Xi Jinping coming within the Chinese Communist Party. Mm. We thought there might be the hope for possibility, at least, of, of liberalization. And, and there's been this hardening. There's been a moving in the other direction. Um, we didn't see, many people didn't see somebody like Gorbachev emerging within the Soviet system and making possible the changes that happened in 1989. So it's hard for me to see how the Hong Kong story can end differently unless there's a change in Beijing. But I can also see, and again, going back to the sort of anti-colonial movement where it fails, it fails, it fails until somehow it succeeds. You can see the attitude of not wanting to give up on a beloved place. And Hong Kong does um, stir this, this kind of passionate um, concern by people within, within the city, many of them. Uh, for your book, you talked to former Hong Kong governor Chris Patton, and uh, he said something memorable. Yeah, I, I was very curious to, to meet him. Um, it was a very strange experience because he's Lord Patton of Barnes, and my vision of what meeting um, somebody with a title from Britain is based mostly on like watching period dramas. And so when I went out to interview him, I thought a butler would answer the door. <laughs> and a great, great. So he came to the door himself and, you know, we immediately started talking. He went, when, 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 when was I last in Hong Kong? And we talked about John le Carre novels. We talked about Orwell. We were just talking the about The Honorable fiction. School Boy was set in Hong Kong. Yeah, exactly. That was one of the first things we, included we, we talked about. Included in the Foreign Correspondence Club. And so... Um, but then I, I wanted to ask him what he thought of a proposition that I was starting to work out for the book, which was I said, what would you think of the idea that in the future, historians looking back on Hong Kong from 1997 forward might be surprised by two things. Surprised by how light a touch Beijing had exerted on Hong Kong during the first uh, 15 years or so after the handover. But then they would also be surprised by how quickly Beijing had begun tightening the screws from about 2014 on. And he nodded. I was very glad. And then he said, when the snow starts to melt, it melts quickly. I thought that was great. Yeah. Um, following on from that metaphor, um, you've also quoted... Um, my favorite Dylan Thomas poem, Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night, in thinking about Hong Kong and what's happening there now. Um, and you've suggested that maybe what we're looking at is um, that a way of life in Hong Kong is dying. Um, you know, given that you, you've said you don't see, uh, you don't see that continuing to survive unless something changes in Beijing. But given, what's, given the resilience of the protesters, that these protests have gone on so much longer than anyone expected, um, largely peaceful even with violent moments, um, do you see that there might still be some room to keep some of the space that's made Hong Kong special uh, for many decades, but especially over these past couple of decades? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I quoted the Dylan Thomas line, you know, do not go gentle into that good night, but rage, rage against the dying of the light before the protests had begun again. And I think, well, first of all, we, we won't know for a long time. Mm. You know, we won't know. And also, it's been amazing how much creativity there has been within the movement that in some ways, it's not just preserving what was there before, but there's been a new kind of Hong Kong identity and Hong Kong artistic identity, there's now a song uh, kind of anthem for Hong Kong that didn't exist before that's really stirring, that, that affects many people. It's possible that um, now I would say part of this Hong Kong will stay alive. The question is, will it stay alive physically in that place that we think of as Hong Kong? Or, in or will it stay 
in people's minds or in diaspora settings or in Hong Kong or communities and other places? Or will vestiges of it be still there underground within Hong Kong while it takes place other places? The very chilling thing is that some people I know within Hong Kong are now talking about Belfast. They're talking about Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. They're talking about a long protracted struggle. And you just don't know where that will end. So maybe I'm, I haven't become more hopeful about a sort of rosy scenario in the near term. But I guess I think it's more important to keep a, a Dylan Thomas is about is writing about somebody who is going to die. No question about it. With Hong Kong, that's that's not certain. Well, on that note, um, we've. <laughs> That's all the time we have tonight. So on behalf of World Affairs, please join me in thanking Dr. Jeff Wasserstrom for his insights and for his book, For Vigil, Hong Kong on the Brink. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you.